Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday night Manna in the Middle service. It is good to be together as we take this moment of pause in our Lenten journey to reflect on what God would have for us, to be encouraged, to remember that we are part of a larger community, uh, and to pray, sing, and hear from God's Word together. I invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, we love you. We thank you for your presence with us tonight, wherever we are. And I ask, Lord, that you would bless us in whatever way we need to receive it. Lord, especially today, we remember in prayer those who have lost loved ones to COVID as we passed the horrific milestone of 500,000 lives lost. It is too much to comprehend, and yet we must take a moment to acknowledge it. And so right now, as we pray, Lord, we take this moment of quiet to honor and remember these precious lives lost. And as we remember, we also share in the hope of resurrection. We share in the knowledge from Scripture that you have come to save, to redeem, to rescue, and to bring us eternal life with you. And so we thank you for that gift, even in the midst of grief and struggle. And Lord, for whatever needs we may be carrying, I pray you would give us the courage to lay them down at your feet, to rest from the pressures of the day, and to lift our needs up to you in prayer, as well as our joys and those things that make us smile and keep us going. So Lord, we thank you for all of this. We ask for your wisdom to guide us, for your Holy Spirit to move through us to bless others. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin, I do want to just mention when, once more that these flowers here are in memory of Gary Sackman, uh, whose memorial service was this past week. So do lift up his family in prayer as we continue tonight. So welcome to worship. Welcome especially to our confirmation students. Uh, and let us remember Pastor Pete and Jenny in prayer as they are having a week off down in Kansas. I just pray that it's a restful time for them as well. Well, we're continuing our Lenten series, The Five Habits of Highly Missional People. You may have had the opportunity to watch one or two of the videos, or perhaps you have flipped through the book and done some reading. I do you want to let you know there are more copies of the book available in our Narthex and then here on Sunday morning uh, in, in the CLC as we worship together. So please grab a copy if you don't have one. It is a great book. It's a great read, and it just really helps you think about what it means to be evangelistic, to spread the word of Christ, and how to do that in ways that will bless people. So let's talk about cultivating habits. The purpose of this study is to help us together reflect on five habits that will help us to be more missional. So we'll get to that missional word in a minute, but for now I just want to think about what it takes to cultivate habits, especially good ones. It seems like the bad ones are not hard to cultivate at all, but the good habits require some work. And as I thought about this past year and the pandemic, it, I began to think about how perhaps we started off last year, 2020, a little differently than we ended it. And I don't know if you're anything like the gal in this video that we're going to play, or me, <laughs> but maybe you started off this pandemic journey with, uh, with some high lofted ambitions, and perhaps they ended up differently than you thought. 2020 goals. 2021 suggestions? Get some stamps in this passport. Get stamps. Like, like go to the post office and get stamps. This year, I'm gonna make so much money, never gonna run out. This year, I'm gonna get so much toilet paper, never gonna run out. This is the year. Finally gonna do that marathon. Netflix marathon. The Crown. Queen's Gambit, 
all those shows I've been putting on. This year, I'm gonna up my fashion game. No more yoga pants every day. Wear pants. I'm gonna make my health a priority. Only clean eating for me. All right, try to eat one green thing a day. A week. A month. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but I can certainly relate. There were a lot of lofty goals that I had that really didn't quite work out the way I had anticipated. And so here I am with many of us probably trying to make up for some lost time now as we begin to round the corner and hopefully get to the end of, of this pandemic season. But maybe we all made those pandemic resolutions or maybe we started out 2020 with lofty goals about things we wanted to do. Maybe we wanted to become really great bakers. A lot of us were, you know, flour was selling out at the beginning of the pandemic because we were all just trying to uh, cultivate some fun habits and give some comfort to our lives. Or maybe you wanted to exercise and you got that treadmill like I did, or you got some other piece of equipment in your home gym. I did a study and it turned out that the Peloton bike sales, their, their company doubled in sales during the pandemic from 910 million in 2019 to 1.8 billion in 2020. So a lot of us had that idea that we were gonna take this time to get fit, to take care of ourselves in ways that were safe. Or maybe you decided to create or embellish your craft closet. Maybe you were going to get into handmade cards or scrapbooking like you had never done before. See, it's hard to cultivate these habits. These are all good and noble things, but sometimes it's tough to keep them going. In fact, there was a study done in 1988 on 200 people who had made New Year's resolutions, and they were tracked for two years. And in fact, what they found out was that for one week, 77% of the people studied were able to keep those resolutions for one week, 77%. That's more than three quarters. But by the time you got to two years, that had gone down to 19%. So that's a big difference. For two, for two years, 19% of the people who had made resolutions in the study were able to keep them. So yeah, it's not as good as 77%. I'll give you that, but it is one in five. So I began to think as I was contemplating this and thinking about this study, so what did it take for those one in five people to keep those resolutions for two years? For those of you who have been able to keep a resolution, what did it take? What did it take to cultivate those good habits? Well, there have been one or two that maybe I've been able to keep. And what I find is, and what's, what's confirmed by the book that we're studying through this Lenten season, there's actually three things that really help. When we're trying to cultivate good habits, three things help. One is mindfulness. To be actually aware of what we're doing. So for people who might want to eat healthier, they're keeping a food diary or exercise. They're keeping a, a log of the times that they exercise or the number of glasses of water they drink. Just to be mindful of what they're doing and the purpose behind it. See, we don't just want to eat healthier to necessarily fit into smaller clothes, although that's a good goal. We want to eat healthier so that we can have more energy and be more present in our lives. So that's a bigger purpose. So being mindful of the purpose behind the habit is a helpful thing. Another thing is to have community. So many social media groups have popped up around topics and habits that people want to cultivate. They want to save money. Maybe they're part of an investment group and they keep tabs on each other. Or maybe they're part of uh, a particular workout group or a gym and they can connect with each other that way. So having community is helpful. And part of that with community is the practice of accountability. It's not just all doing the same thing, but all checking on one another, saying, hey, how you doing? It's been four weeks. How's it going with that resolution? Tell me what's going on with you. And in fact, a lot of these things are just part and parcel of being part of the body of Christ as well. We have small groups so that we can say to each other, how is it with your soul? We meet together to remind ourselves that we're not alone. We're constantly being reminded through the scriptures and through hopefully the leaders among us 
of what the purpose is in our following Christ. So these are ways to develop and keep good habits. We know that is true. So what does it mean to develop good missional habits? Right? The, the title of our book is The Five Missional Habits, The Five Habits of Missional People. So how do we do that? Well, first, it's probably good to talk about what missional means. <laughs> like evangelism, it's kind of one of those churchy words, and we may not always know exactly what we're talking about unless we're clear on our definitions. So when we talk about missional, what we're talking about is that there are practices that we keep that alert others to the active presence and work of God. And in fact, I would even go further to develop something that was said in the book. All that we do and say alerts others to the active presence and work of God. It's almost as if we develop habits so that everything that we do and the words that we say and the way that we interact with each other and the things that take priority in our lives alert others to the active presence and work of God. Because, beloved, God's at work. And God is present all the time. Sometimes we notice it. <laughs> but God is always present and at work. And if we can develop good habits, we can help others to see it. We can even be more aware of it ourselves if we can develop some of these habits. So these missional habits then if we're going to develop them, are practices that result from God's presence and work and invite others in. So it's, these habits are our response to God's ongoing work. We recognize that God is at work. We want to be part of it. And so we develop practices that invite others to see it as well. And in so doing, we are constantly reminded of God's work and presence in the world. So this Lent, we are focusing on that. We are focusing on developing missional habits that help us to alert others in gracious and loving ways to God's work in the world. So let's talk about that first habit. If you got to watch the video from Reverend Rudabush this week, you will have seen it a little bit about it already. The first habit is to bless. So the first thing that we're going to practice doing as missional people, is to bless others. And the word bless comes from a few different places, but there's one particular etymological meaning that I really like, and I wanted to spend some time on it tonight. And that is the, the, the idea of strengthening the arm. That's actually a, a, a meaning that has uh, derived from, or the word bless has derived from, to strengthen the arm of someone. I just love that idea that when we're weak, Someone comes along to strengthen us, to give us courage, to give us strength. And it immediately made me think of a story in the Bible. Some of you may know this already. It comes from the book of Exodus in chapter 17. And the passage I want to read first comes from verses 10 to 13 of that chapter. And then I'll talk a little bit about the background because I think it's important for us. So Joshua is taking the Israelites out to fight the Amalekites. And what they find is that Moses is going up to the top of a hill while Joshua and the armies are going out to fight. And what they find is that as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites would win and do well. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites would win. So here it says in verse 12, when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put, her, put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua and the Israelites won the battle. What a powerful image. Moses was so tired and weary that he couldn't hold his arms up himself. So others came along and held his arms up strengthened his arms. What an image. But it's even more powerful when we look a little bit further up in the chapter. I know uh, you probably know already that I like to do that. <laughs> I like to see what happens just before what we're looking at. And here's what happened. At the beginning of chapter 17 of the book of Exodus, the Israelites are out in the wilderness. They're traveling. 
They camp at a place called Rephidim, and there's no water. So they get angry, and they start to fight with Moses, and they demand, give us water to drink. And they say, you know, why do you bring us up out of Egypt and make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? So they're starting to complain and grumble, if they haven't already, with Moses. And Moses then says to God, okay, what am I supposed to do with these people? They're ready to stone me. Like, I'm, I am done with these people. And so the Lord answers him and says, go out, take with you some elders in your hand and uh, strike the rock at Horeb and water will come out. So Moses does this. The water comes out despite everyone's grumbling. And this is the best part. He actually names the place testing and quarreling. That's the name he gives the place. He says he calls the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Testing and quarreling happened, lots of it, just before this passage in verses 10 to 13. So not a lot of blessing happened right before our text for today. In fact, a lot of the opposite of blessing is what happened. So imagine Moses, he's been dealing with all these fi this fighting. He's been having to advocate for his people with the Lord, even though they can't stand him and they're grumbling against him. Imagine how weary Moses must have been. Imagine how weary they all must have been. Thirsty, not knowing where water was going to come from, not knowing how long they were going to be out in the wilderness. And yet, just after that, God gives a powerful image of cooperation and of care and of blessing to the Israelites. And I couldn't help but think about this pandemic time. And wonder how many of us are feeling like we're in the wilderness. How many of us are feeling weary and done? I mean, pandemic fatigue is a thing, right? How many of us feel like we just can't keep holding this stuff up? What do we need? I think we need some blessing. And I think the people around us might need some blessing as well. So our first habit is to cultivate this practice of blessing others. And I think it's really important that as we practice this habit, we get a few things straight first. And I want to talk first about what blessing is not, so that we get clear on what blessing actually is, right? Well, the first blessing, thing that blessing is not is flattery. To bless someone, you need to get particular. Saying to someone, hey, I really like your hair today, is nice. I'm not sure it gets us to blessing, though. And the second thing that blessing does not do is it doesn't seek recognition. It doesn't seek praise or acclaim. To bless someone is simply to give for their sake. It's not recognition. And maybe the most important thing about blessing is that it doesn't attach strings. Have you ever been the recipient of a gift with strings attached? Doesn't feel good, does it? That's not what we're talking about. And I think one way to arrive at some perspective on whether our blessing is done with the right motivation is to ask a key question. If you ask the question, what's in it for me, Perhaps you'll get a sense of where your heart is. Because it's not about you. <laughs> it's not about us. It's not about the one doing the blessing. It's about the receiving of the blessing. So if you can ask yourself honestly that question, what's in it for me? And if there's anything you're expecting to get out of it, blessing, recognition, praise, gifts, something somewhere along the line, if you're keeping score and you expect to call in your debts someday, it's not blessing. So ask yourself that question, if what's in it for me? And then when our hearts are ready to actually give without strings attached, to bless without need of recognition, to bless particularly and not just give empty compliments, maybe we can start. Maybe we can start. So what is blessing? Blessing is particular. 
blessing is particular. It actually requires that we get to know each other beyond a surface level. What is it that, that, that would really bless the socks off this person that you work with or that you go to school with or who lives in the same house as you? What would it take? And if you don't know the answer to that question, get to know that person. Maybe it takes a little bit of time. But blessing is particular and it's unique. Blessing seeks anonymity. You do it just for the sake of doing it because the gift is in the blessing. What I have often found is that when I give and I don't care who gets the credit for it, I'm actually blessed in the process. So blessing seeks anonymity. And then thirdly, blessing gives freely. Gives freely. You know, I have a feeling that it didn't matter how long Moses was going to have to be up on that mountain. Those guys are going to be holding his arms up as long as it took. Freely. Freely. So how can we strengthen someone's arm today? <laughs> how can we begin to cultivate these missional habits? Because it's so important to recognize that we aren't missional people because we want to gain something from them the people that we bless. The point is love. The point is love. We let God do the work of calling. We let God do the work of convicting. We are there to love. And we are there to love, particularly without need for our own praise, generously and freely. So I want to encourage you this week, find one, maybe two or three people to bless. Try to find someone to bless who is not part of your circle. Maybe not part of this church. Somebody who's on the outside of something in your life. Find a way to bless them particularly without seeking any credit for yourself and without strings attached. I want to invite you to do that as we pray. Lord, thank you for this time that we have spent together today. I ask that you would give a special measure of blessing to these, your people so that we may in turn be generous blessers of others. I ask all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. How do you explain? How do you discard a love that goes from east to west and runs as deep as it is wide? You know all our hopes, Lord, you know our fears, and words cannot express the love we Song 
will praise and flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are. The words are not enough to tell you of our love. So listen to our Listen to our hearts, hear our spirit sing, the song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are. Words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our heart. 